In this video, we're going to be doing the lab that covers the kingdom Animalia for our last taxonomy lab. Uh, the material really starts on page 310. Now, one of the things that I wanted to start with for this chapter is that a lot of students, the second I say animal, what pops into their head is mammal. And mammals are one type of animal, but there are way more kinds of animals that are out there, including the one that's on the screen right now. That's a jellyfish or a jelly. Um, it's called a crown jellyfish. Uh, it's in the phylum Cnidaria, which is one that we'll learn about a little bit later on, but it is an animal. And so you kind of have to decouple animal with mammal just so that you don't, I don't know, sort of focus in on only one type of animal. Now, kind of like with the previous groups, a lot of the animals are animals that you don't think of all the time, like jellyfish or worms or insects even, but at least in this kingdom, you will have heard of most of them. It's just not one that you think of all the time. Lots of Latin names in this one. And once again, one of the best ways to study that is with flashcards. So I would recommend that you make some of those to help you study this. One of the other advantages to this is the taxonomy of animals has held fairly constant for a long time. And so the lecture and the lab stuff go together really well when it comes to the animal kingdom. So what makes an animal an animal? They have complex cells, so they're eukaryotic. They are all made out of more than one cell, so they're multicellular. We have to be able to ingest our nutrients, and so we're heterotrophic because we can't make our own. And then at some point in our life cycle, we're motile or capable of movement. Now, that doesn't mean we stay that way. Um, going back to some of the animals that you don't think of all the time, like maybe a sponge, they don't move around when they're adults, but their larval forms at least do. Uh, most animals are going to have to have some form of sexual reproduction, although a lot of animals can also reproduce asexually, but most of them want to do it sexually because it just increases genetic diversity and that makes things better. So here we have a couple of different mammals. We've got two that hopefully everybody in this room recognizes. So cats, dogs, they're mammals, so they are animals. Now we're going to start with the ones that you tend to not think about as much. Sponges are animals. They satisfy all those characteristics from earlier. Everything that is a sponge that is alive is in the phylum periphera, which basically means holy looking. They have these holes in the cell, not cell, but animal body on the side, and they take in water and then filter material out. So they're creating this current. This is a food safe dye that they're pumping into the water, just so you can see how they move water. So even though they don't look like much, again, they are animals. They are actively seeking out food and then catching that food through these specialized little cells that are called coanocytes. Um, the adults don't move around, but they do move water through them. Most sponges are going to be found in marine settings, which means salt water, although you can find some in fresh water as well. So this is the phylum periphera, and that's how they eat filter feeding. Next, phylum Cnidaria. Anything that has tentacles that you don't want to touch because it would hurt you, that would go into this group. So that would be corals and sea anemones and hydras and a bunch of things that probably you don't know about at this point, but this includes jellyfish. These are all, again, mostly marine, although you can find a few in freshwater. The tentacles have these special cells called cnidocytes on them. Those are stinging cells, and they are the reason why you don't want to touch those uh, tentacles. The type of symmetry that it describes here, so a lot of animals have what's known as bilateral symmetry, which means there's only one way that you can cut them to get two equal halves. In this particular group, and in a lot of the sponges from earlier though, they're more like pizza shapes. You can cut them in half in a bunch of different directions. That's what radial means. There's two basic body plans that can be found within the phylum Cnidaria, a polyp or a medusa. Polyps tend to be stuck down to the base or the rock or whatever at the bottom of the water, and they wave their tentacles up in the air, and they don't move around too much. They sometimes can, but they prefer to just wave their tentacles like the coral in this gift down here is doing. So this is a polyp. The other option is the typical jellyfish body plan, which is a free-swimming. Tentacles tend to hang down, so that's the medusa stage. Now, one of the things the lab manual mentions is cnidocytes, and I did mention them a second ago, too. So these are the stinging cells. Um, this is something that only just recently was actually captured on the microscope, and so I wanted to show you the video of how the cnidocytes actually work.
Hey, it's me, Destin, and welcome back to Smarter Every Day. If you've ever been stung by a jellyfish, you know that it's awful. Let me show you. <coughs> so there's two ways that an animal can harm a human chemically, right? The first one is poison. We know what that is. Like, if I were to eat this jellyfish and it was poisonous and I were to get sick, it's because it is a poisonous animal, right? Now, venom is different. Venom is injected into your body. So it's kind of like these hypodermic needles. If you fill them up with venom and then you were to take that and inject that into your arm, that would be a venomous way of causing pain to your body, right? So wouldn't it be crazy if there was like hypodermic needles built into their tentacles and they could just stab you with them as soon as they rubbed up against you? Because that's exactly what happens. Jellyfish ten. All right, I really like his description of poisonous versus venomous there, so I wanted you to see that. But now I'm going to kind of just fast forward to the place where we start to see their nidocytes working. So they took the tentacles from some sea anemones, which are in this phylum, and then they stimulated them with a little electrical current. And you'll be able to see their little hypodermic needles, essentially, flying out of them. Maybe I wanted to be a little bit farther back and then injecting venom into whatever it's trying to do. off their little electro music there. So this happened just in response to an electrical stimulation. So it's those little stinging cells didn't even know there was another tentacle next to them. Just by virtue of we hit it with some electricity, it fired off the nidocytes. There's a little structure in the nidocyte called an nematocyst, which is kind of the harpoony thing that you see shooting out here. And then you can even see the venom that starts to come out there at the end. So that is how tentacled things like uh, the jellyfish or the sea anemone actually work. And it's the reason why they can be fatal. There are some that are called box jellies that can kill you in less than five minutes. But most of the time, if you get stung by one of these, it just really super duper hurts. It's not going to kill you most of the time. All right. Next, this has one of my favorite names, even though I know most of my students tend to hate the name. Phylum platyhelminthes, which literally means flatworms. Anytime you see helminth, it means worm, and platy means flat. So these look like worms that you have taken between the books, uh, pages of a book, and you have smushed them flat. Um, this is our first group that does have bilateral symmetry. That is going to mean we have a head end and we have a butt end, or a tail end, if you prefer. That means we can start to focus our sense organs in one place and we can start to develop a brain next to those sense organs. And so we're starting to get more advanced, although I don't think any of us would say a flatworm is going to be winning um, a, a, a membership into Mensa at any point. But they have a head-like region. Now this little guy, I know it's hard to tell, but there's an eye spot right there. So this is his head region. This is his or her tail region. A lot of them are actually hermaphrodites, so they're kind of both at the same time, but cephalization means head end. Um, acelomates, they have no body cavity. Since they are smushed flat, they don't really have a hollow space inside of them. They just have their digestive system that runs through them. Some of these are gonna be parasitic, but some of them are actually free living. Um, so we're going to be talking mostly about the parasitic ones, because uh, free living, nobody cares about free living worms because they don't hurt people, they don't necessarily help people, and so let's just talk about the ones that we do care about. First platyhelminth that people should at least care about is tapeworms. Now, tapeworms are one that most Americans are more familiar with as things that your dog might get or your cat might get, but people can totally get tapeworms too. Um, in fact, this is a CT scan of a person who ate some pork that had not been cooked properly. Now, this is not going to happen if you are buying USDA inspected pork. There won't be tapeworms in that pork. But if you hunt feral hogs and you process that meat for yourself, it is possible that potentially you missed that there were some tapeworms in there. And if you don't cook the pork to kill all of the eggs that are in that pork, you can give yourself tapeworms from that. So make sure you always cook your meat before you cook it. So all of these little spots that you're seeing in the pelvic region and then down the legs, these it creates something that's known as sister, so, uh, sister sarcosis. That's a fun one to say. So they have tapeworms all over the place. Normally, tapeworms live in your digestive system, 
but sometimes the larva will escape and move into new places. They can move into your brain and cause overwhelming headaches and psychotic symptoms, mental illness. They can also cause pain if it insists down into the muscle, which is what's happened to this woman off down here. So tapeworms, they're normally gut parasites, but they don't necessarily stay there. Always cook your meat. Flukes. This is not one, I have not ever heard of an American human being getting a fluke. I'm sure it's possible. It's just not common at all for this to happen while tapeworms are. Um, they still live in the digestive system, but not the digestive tract proper. They live in accessory structures. More than likely it's going to be in the liver and then they cause damage to the liver that can lead to cirrhosis and liver failure and then end up requiring a person to get a liver transplant. Um, liver flukes are one of those things that have a crazy complicated life cycle. They usually meet a snail at some point in their life cycle and they'll carry out portions of their life in the snail. And then from the snail, they'll emerge into water. And then if you're traipsing around in a river or something barefoot, their larval form will get into like a cut or a wound, which even if you don't think you have one, you probably do have some sort of small wound on your foot. And so they get in that way and then they'll travel to the liver and cause problems. And so this is what a fluke looks, for, uh, looks like under the microscope. All right, going to another worm group, phylum nematoda. We still have bilateral symmetry. Now we're starting to get a body cavity. So we have a space between the digestive system and the body wall. That space is going to allow us for a little bit better organization, but their space is not completely lined like ours is. So they have what's known as a pseudocelome or a false body cavity, and that's sort of their hallmark characteristic. Um, there's going to be a few worms in here that we're going to be talking about. Now, round worms are called round because they have a round shape. It's kind of hard to tell in this particular picture, because um, the worm has insisted in a person's muscle and they're coiled up in this little ball. But you can hopefully sort of tell that they have a round shape to them. This is Trichinella spiralis. They cause a disease known as trichinosis. Once again, usually comes from eating undercooked pork. The worms will go from the pork, travel through your digestive system wall, and then get into your skeletal muscle, like your biceps and your quadriceps, and insist in there so that every time you move, it causes pain in the muscle. So just, again, always cook your meat. Uh, pinworms are a super fun one. And the reason why I say that is um, it's very likely that a child that you know has had pinworms at some point in their life. And it's, it's a very common infection in school-aged children because school-aged children don't understand hygiene at all. And if their butt itches, they'll just reach down their pants and scratch it. And when they do that, they'll get the eggs from pinworms underneath their fingernails and stuff. And then if you know anything about a school-aged child, it's not like they just went from I scratched my butt to I better go wash my hands for 20 seconds. No, their hand is next going to go up their nose or in their eye or in their mouth. They don't care. Or it's going to go onto a toy and then another kid's going to pick up the toy and then lick the toy. And now they've got pinworm eggs inside of their mouth. And so very, very common in daycares and elementary schools. Um, their, their hallmark trait that sort of makes them amusing to me is that while they live in your digestive system, they come out at night to lay their eggs. And when I say they come out at night, I mean they will crawl out of your butthole and then glue their eggs around your butthole. And the glue that they use to glue the eggs in place is very itchy, which is what makes a person scratch their butt the next day and then get the eggs under the fingernails and start the whole process all over again. Um, there is an old school diagnostic test used to diagnose pinworms and it's called the tape test and it is really as simple as get a piece of uh, scotch tape stick it to the butthole pull it off and then look for eggs under the microscope or in this case they're actually showing you how to mail the tape off to a lab so that you could have the lab look at it but quite frankly i've got a microscope of myself i wouldn't have to send it off but this is what live pinworms look like they are very small worms you do need a microscope to see them um, you would need a magnifying glass to be able to see the eggs as well, but you'd be able to see them if you had a magnifying glass. Mm. Um, next, Ascaris lumbricoides. Um, usually this is just called Ascaris. It causes Ascariasis, which is an infection of Ascaris. Uh, they get into your digestive system. Um, I am not sure what kind of animal this was that made this gift, but we are in the intestines of an animal, and these are forbidden spaghetti noodles, I suppose, but these things that look like spaghetti noodles it's actually all Ascaris. These are very large round worms that look again like, quite frankly, forbidden, uh, forbidden spaghetti. But they're squeezing the worms out because this 
either animal or person just has a raging case. Now, I have adopted dogs from animal shelters for a for almost all of my dogs. One I just sort of inherited, but most of them I've had to go to a shelter and get them. And the very first thing you should do anytime you're getting any animal from a shelter is take them to a vet. Because chances are, if it's coming from a shelter, it has fleas. And fleas are a way for lots of horrible things to get in and out of your animal, um, like heartworms, or in this case, the Ascaris. And so I have had to worm dogs, and I have had stuff looking like this come out of the butt of a dog that I've adopted from a shelter. And it's their version. It's it's called a hookworm in them, but it's this, but in a dog. And so if you've ever had a shelter dog, make sure you get them proper vet care, because this is not comfortable for any person or animal to have. All right. This is another one I just want to mention because as an animal lover, I just want to make sure I get the news out there. And that is heartworms in dogs are also in the phylum nematoda. Heartworms are transmitted usually through mosquito bites. Um, so your dog could just be outside playing, not in contact with any other dogs, and a mosquito bites them. And you don't know, your dog can't tell you they got bitten by a mosquito, but that mosquito spit the eggs of a heartworm into your dog. And now your dog has heartworms. There are very good preventatives that can prevent your dog from getting heartworms. Personally, my dogs get something called heart guard and they take that pill every month. They like it. They will actually, well, they'll chase me down for it. They really like their heart guard essentially, but it's to make sure they don't get heartworms because heartworms will kill your dog. It's very difficult to treat. Even if you're treating your dog, there's a chance that your dog doesn't recover from that because they actually damage the heart muscle itself. So please, if you have an animal, Make sure it's getting its proper preventative care because, again, it would really suck to lose a dog that you love because it got a mosquito bite and you didn't know it and they got heartworms. Um, next, Phylum Annelida, our last little group of worms. These are what are known as segmented worms, and you can see why when you see them up close. This is a segment, that's a segment, that's a segment. They have lots of segments that repeat themselves all the way down. Within those segments, they tend to repeat structures, like this segment has its own pair of sort of kidney-like things, this segment has its own pair of kidney-like things, and so on, all the way down the worm. So that's why they're called segmented worms. These are more advanced than the nematodes and the platyhelminths, because not only do they have a really good urinary system, they also have an amazing circulatory system with closed blood vessels, just like we have closed blood vessels. In fact, they have blood that is very similar to our blood. They have a true coelom, just like we have a true coelom. It's completely lined. The coelom is that body cavity or the space between the digestive system and the body wall. So they have that. So even though you don't think of a worm as being highly evolved, they are very complex animals. So nowadays, luckily, the lab manual does not expect you to know the horrible class names that go along with the different kind of worms, but they do want you to know that there's a few different kinds of annelids. First off is the earthworms. Um, I'll tell you the horrible name, but you don't have to remember it. This is in the group Oligochaeta. Um, it's called that because they have few bristles. That's what Oligochaeta actually means. If you've ever held an earthworm, they have these little spots on them that feel sort of like little bitty splinters. Those are citae or chitae, whichever way you want to say that. I'm perfectly fine in either one, but they only have a few of them. That's why they're Oligochaetes. And so... This is what earthworms are characterized by, is those few bristles that you really, it's hard to see them, but you can feel them if you've ever felt an earthworm. Leeches are also in this group. They do not have the citae, those bristles that are on them. One of the things that I do want to um, make sure you understand is that not all leeches are bloodsuckers. Now, these are the ones that we're more familiar with, but there's a lot of leeches out there that just travel around through the soil and look for small insects and stuff to eat. They don't suck blood. Those that do suck blood, they actually make a couple of chemicals that help them in that act. The only one your lab manual tells you about is one called hyridin, which is an anticoagulant. That means it thins your blood so that you don't clot. They don't want you to clot because then you stop feeding them, and so they are secreting that blood thinner into you so you bleed longer and feed the leech all it wants to feed. Now, your lab manual sort of makes it seem like um, bloodletting was just a thing of the past, but we do still use leeches in the medical community to this day. Nurses hate leech therapy because leeches don't exactly stay put. Once they've had their full, they will decouple themselves from who they were eating from and then travel away, leaving a little bloody trail. And so you will hear like horror stories sometimes from nurses who have dealt with leeches where they have to follow blood trails to find the leech that had fed on a person. 
um, to help with decongestive therapy after like a mastectomy or something along those lines. And so we do still use them is the point of that horrible story. All right. Bristle worms are one that you guys probably are not that familiar with, but if you've ever been scuba diving out in the ocean, you might have seen Nereus, which is who this is. They have lots of bristles. They are in the old class polyketa, which means lots of bristles. So the keti are all these little things that kind of look like legs, but they really aren't. They're bristles that stick off of the body. So that's why they are called polychaetes, because they have many bristles. Phylum mollusca is a fun one. This is where we start to get into things that you might be a little bit more familiar with, again, like snails and slugs and octopus and things like that. These guys have a mantle that will usually secrete a shell, but if you have something like a slug that doesn't have a shell, the mantle works as a gas exchange organ, sort of like their version of a lung. They feed with a structure called a radula. So the radula is in the mouth of this snail as it scarfs this lettuce up right here. And everything in the phylum mollusca has a muscular foot, but it looks very different in a clam than it does in an octopus. But they do all have a muscular foot. This time there are classes they want you to know the name of. Class gastropoda literally means stomach foot. Gastro is stomach, poda is foot. So their stomach is in their foot. This is where both the snails and slugs go. This is a sea slug. So if you walk outside after a rain, you've seen a regular old snail. But this is a sea slug that lives in the ocean, and they are often very, very brightly colored, as this one is right here. They do also have tentacles that have eyes on them. Um, I just saw a Reddit post the other day that was a Today I Learned that snails and things have eyes. And yes, they do. It's at the end of their tentacles. Cephalopoda means head foot. Their foot has been modified into a head. Um, now, when I say they are the most advanced invertebrates in the world, I mean they are capable of thought and problem solving and boredom and puzzle completion. They are brilliant animals in their own way, and they are also mischievous little animals. There was actually a story that I just saw the other day that was apparently in Australia there is a turf war going on and octopus will just go up and like punch a fish just because it amuses them apparently or it's part of their war. So yeah there's a society of octopus and squid down in the ocean and we just don't understand how to communicate with them at all but they, they've got thoughts going on in their little heads. So some of the things that I'm trying to show you here. Capable of problem solving. This one got scared, so he's covering himself up in a shell from a clam. Two, actually. This one is to show you, this was a big news story like a year ago. A cameraman had set up a camera to record an octopus while he was dreaming. And so this is, like, if you've ever watched a dog as they're dreaming, they get... Okay, sorry, doorbell rang. I got distracted. We were talking about the octopus that was dreaming, though. Um, so I was mentioning dogs get twitchy and we always say things like, oh, they're chasing a rabbit in their dreams. Well, this is the octopus dreaming about whatever an octopus dreams about and doing the color change. They can control every single cell on the outside of their body and change its color and change its texture. And that's what this one's doing. And they change color as part of their communication. Like they'll become more red when they get agitated, but they usually do that as some form of camouflage. Um, top picture up here, this is a squid. Uh, they have more tentacles and then a couple of arms and then eight arms for the octopus. Nautilus has a bunch of arms. I don't have a gif of a Nautilus right now, but this shows you just the color changing. If you ever manage to um, see a squid up close and in person, it is completely mesmerizing to just watch the colors flicker and the cells that are called chromatophores on their skin. They're just gorgeous to watch. Their eyes are just as advanced as ours. In fact, better adapted for the low light conditions that they face in the water. Again, they have a brain and they're capable of teaching and problem solving. I, I hope you have some respect for some of these things. There's some other fun videos that you can find online. One of my favorite ones is there were some kayakers in the ocean and an octopus, um, well, I guess it was actually a seal, now that I think about it, but a seal just slapped a kayaker with an octopus, so the octopus was probably messing with the seal before that happened. But anyway, go, go amuse yourself with some octopus videos, because they are amusing. Uh, polyplacophora means many plates, and that's basically, think roly-poly, but in a slug, which is why I put that top thing up there. So instead of having the lots of legs like a roly-poly would have down here, they have the slug body. They eat algae off the surface of rocks. So that's what a chitin is. I, I gave you the gift because most Texans not super familiar with a chitin, but that's it. Class bivalvia is called that because they have two shells. 
Um, this includes clams, oysters, mussels. This is a scallop and they can clap their shell to kind of swim around. They don't look super graceful as they do it, but yay, the scallop is going. All right, next, phylum arthropoda. Um, most of the time when I'm in class with students, they mispronounce this and say anthropoda. Well, that would mean man foot and they don't have man feet. It's arthropoda, which means jointed feet or jointed legs in this case. And so that's what is the hallmark characteristic of this group is their little jointed legs. Um, one of the other features that's unique to the arthropods is they have an exoskeleton. When you have an exoskeleton, it limits your growth, which means if you want to grow, you got to get rid of the old skeleton and then regrow a completely new one. And that's what this tarantula is doing. It's in the process of molting its exoskeleton so it can grow. Um, this is another one they're going to make you learn the class names on, which I don't give you the classes I don't think for these in lecture. I have to go back and look at my lecture stuff. But anyway, centipedes are chylopodes. Um, these are carnivorous little things. They will bite people and they are venomous. They don't usually kill people, though. It just hurts is my understanding. I've never been bitten by a centipede, but don't mess with one if you see it, basically. Uh, millipedes, these are herbivores. They are not venomous. If anything, they're stinky. They secrete a stinky secretion so that other things will try not to eat them. They do have two pairs of legs per segment. That's where the diplo get comes from, two pairs of legs per segment, so millipedes. Some people have some of these as pets because they can be quite large, but I don't, most people, normal people, don't do that. Um, this is a new class to me, Malacostraca. Um, this used to be the class Crustacea or the class Decapoda, but now the lab manual says it's in this class, which I'm unfamiliar with it. I'm just sorry about that. But this includes your crabs, your lobsters. Um, around here we have crawdads or crayfish, whichever way you want to say that. You can find some freshwater shrimp as well. Um, again, I just amuse myself too much on the internet, but never give a lobster or a crab a knife. They will use it against you. Mm. Class Insecta. If you've been outside, you have seen some of these. This is where all the little buggy things are going to go that have six legs and then a pair of wings. And when I say it's a very diverse group, I mean it. There are some things in here that are super tiny and microscopic, and there are some things in here that are crazy big like a blue morpho butterfly. Um, these are leaf cutter ants that I found while I was in Costa Rica. We don't get this species up here. Here we get some big ants. Uh, they're big red ants. We get small ants that are sometimes called piss ants. Nowadays, we also have imported fire ants, which are an invasive species that super sucks. There's another one that I can't remember the name of right now. They're like crazy ants or something. They like to get into electrical equipment that are super problematic, but essentially there's lots of different kinds of ants, and that's just one group of the class Insecta. There's beetles, which includes ladybugs and golden beetles, which is what this is. There's scarab beetles, there's cockroaches, there's the butterflies and moths, there's bees and wasps. There's so many different insects. We can't even talk about all of them, but they all have six legs and a pair of wings. Classarachnida has eight legs. Um, some of them have a modified tail like the scorpion. They all have these little jaw-like things that are called chelicerae that help them eat their food. Um, I personally hate basically everything in this group. I have been stung by a scorpion and just fun fact, they can sting you multiple times. Um, in fact, I was stung somewhere between five to eight times. I'm not really sure because I was too young, but I, I was stung a lot by the scorpion and it super sucked to get stung by a scorpion because it gets more intense each time they sting you. There are some cute spiders since I hate spiders very, 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 very much. So this is a dancing spider that is called a peacock spider. Um, there's again some cute videos of them out there dancing in like YMCA, which they're not really dancing to the song. Just a fun fact on these guys, it's the males that are showy and dancing, and if they dance well, they get to have sex. If they dance poorly, the female eats them, so they got to do it right. Now, this is just my fun reminder on why I really, 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 really hate spiders. Around here, there's a spider called a wolf spider. Wolf spiders are back brooders, which means they carry their babies on their backs. And one time I was outside, not really watching where I was going, and I stepped on one. And the next thing I know, I have dozens of baby spiders crawling up my legs. And that is not something that I have been able to get over ever since then. This person is experiencing the same thing. They squished the spider with the broom. And then look at all the little baby spiders come running away from the mom that we have smushed with the broom. So, yeah. I hate spiders, so always will. Next, phylum Echinodermata literally means spiny skin. Anything that has spiny sort of calcareous skin is in this group. So sea stars, crinoids, 
brittle stars, sea urchins, sand dollars, sea cucumbers, they are all in this group. Um, they have a true body cavity. They have as adults radial symmetry, but their larva has bilateral symmetry. This is our first group that is a coelomate, which means they have a true body cavity, but that are deuterostomes. The last three things that we've talked about, those were all what are known as protostomes. So when a blastula is developing, the first opening that develops is called the blastopore. In protostomes, that opening becomes the mouth. In deuterostomes, that opening becomes the anus. And so these two groups are named based on what happens to the first opening that develops in the embryo. One of the fun features of phylum echinodermata is if you cut their arm off, they can regrow their arm. If you cut off the arm and enough of what's known as the central disc, they can actually regrow the whole body from that arm too. So this is a type of asexual reproduction that they're capable of doing. Okay, next. Everything else from here on out is in the phylum chordata. It is a big phylum that includes most of the animals that you would be more familiar with from fish all the way up through you. The four features that are up here are all unique to this phylum, and they are something that all members of the phylum have, but some of them only keep it for certain points of their life cycle. Notochord. Um, so in this picture, the notochord is this sort of beigey structure that's going on right through here. In us, that's going to become, and that should say, our backbone. So the vertebrae that go around your spinal cord, that's what the notochord develops into in you. The dorsal hollow nerve cord will develop into the brain and then the spinal cord, which is inside the vertebra. Pharyngeal slits in us, that becomes a portion of the jaw. And then the postanal tail, we absorbed that, but we used to have one when we were in embryo. Everything else is going to be a class within that phylum. So class Agnatha, that name literally means no jaw because this group is what is known as jawless fish. They cannot open and close their mouth. It's just always open like you can see in these creepy little guys off down here. These are hagfish. They are sometimes called eels, but they're not really eels. Hagfish. Hagfish are decomposers. They, if something is dead and it falls to the bottom of the ocean, these are the guys that will go clean that up for us essentially. Um, the lots of slime things. So this is just a fun little story for you. Um, in July of 2017, a truck carrying hagfish overturned and all of the water and the fish sloshed out of the truck onto this poor car right here. And so all of this slime, the hagfish secreted it because they sensed that they were in danger. And you can even see some of the hagfish hanging out in the slime afterwards. They're stuck in their own slime at this point. So that's the slime I'm talking about. Next, chondrichthys. So anytime you see ichthys, that means fish. Like an ichthyologist is a person who studies fish. Cond is cartilage. So this word literally means cartilage fish. So they have a skeleton, but instead of being made out of bone, it's made out of cartilage. With the exception of the jaws, the jaws are still made out of bone. So if you've ever seen that movie, Jaws from the 1970s, the shark fishermen had jaws up on the wall from sharks, and that's the only part that you'll ever have from them because the rest of it is being cartilage, it would just decompose away. So earlier we had forbidden spaghetti. This is a forbidden ravioli, I suppose. This is just a little baby uh, Ray dancing around in the glass of an aquarium, and so he is a cartilaginous fish. Osteichthys means bony fish. So yeah, every fish you've ever known the name of, this is where it goes. So Nemo from Finding Nemo, he's in this group. This is a couple of fish that I, I believe these are gobies, but don't quote me on that. Um, gobies are territorial, and so this one's spitting sand into this guy's house, and then this guy's spitting sand into this other guy's house. Like, they're having a sand spitting war at this point. Not that you can't, you, this guy's house is off over here on the other side, but anyway. Every fish in this picture, bony fish, osteichthys. Class amphibia. Amphibia means, like, amphibious. It means you can live in the water and live in the land. And so this would be things like frogs and newts and salamanders. Um, this is a frog going through metamorphosis. When they're in their tadpole stage, they're sort of like fish. They have a lateral line like fish. They have scales like fish. Um, they eat like fish. Then after the metamorphosis, they can live on land. They don't eat like fish. They don't have the lateral line. They're breathing through their lungs and their skin and not their gills anymore. So they really do have a complete switch if they do the complete metamorphosis to go from a, a watery thing to a land living thing. Class Reptilia. 
this is where, uh, yeah, snakes and turtles and crocodiles and, you know, reptiles go, essentially. Um, this one is just so that you can see how they climb, because I, again, find it just mesmerizing to watch this boa constrictor climb that rope. They can climb trees. They like it in the trees, so they can fall on you from the trees if you're not a snake lover. Um, the factoids that I'm giving you here for them is this is our first group that is really designed to live away from water. In order to do that, they need to have a skin that prevents water loss. So they have scales made out of keratin, helps prevent water loss so that they don't have to drink as much. They also have a layer in the egg called the amnion that allows the baby to stay inside a watery environment. And so they don't have to lay their eggs in water. Everything else that we've talked to about had to lay their eggs in water. And so again, we can now move in on the land and even into desert situations in some cases. Now, since we live in Texas, this is just your fun factoid for snakes. We do have several different kinds of venomous snakes, from coral snakes to rattlesnakes to what's in that picture right there is a water moccasin. What I want to say, so while I hate spiders, I'm never going to play with a spider. I dislike snakes, but I also respect snakes. They have a place. They have a job. They eat varmints that carry disease, and so they are beneficial to the environment as a whole. If it is, you know, in a place where it might attack your dog, I get trying to kill a rattlesnake or something because they can kill your dog if you have a smaller dog. Bigger dogs can usually take a rattlesnake bite and be okay, even a copperhead bite and they'll be okay, but they're going to be very sick for a little while while they get over that venom. There are uh, rattlesnake vaccines for dogs, not for people. Generally speaking, if you see a snake, leave it alone and it's going to leave you alone. They don't want to mess with you any more than you want to mess with them. That said, there are times, because, you know, they're really small, they can be hard to see sometimes, like they can hide in grass and you won't see them, and then all of a sudden you're snip, stepping on a snake that you did not want to step on. Um, they can fall on you from the trees. One of the jobs that I had, a copperhead fell on a person, or jumped on a person, we're not really sure, but anyway, fell on a person, bit them in the neck, we ended up having to take them to the hospital. Um, water moccasins are the only ones that I have ever had them chase me down even though I didn't do anything to them. Most of the time a snake's not going to mess with you unless you try to mess with them. But water moccasins, go ahead and you have my permission to kill them because they're, like I said on the slide, they're just jerks. Class AVs, maybe a class or they might just be reptiles. I have always kind of thought birds are special enough. They deserve to be in their own class, but the DNA evidence really doesn't support that. They are reptiles. Um, if you've ever seen a baby bird without its feathers, you'll understand the whole birds or dinosaurs thing because they very much look like that. This is a shoebill stork, not a species that we have in the United States. But again, kind of when, when I see it, I can totally see the whole birds used to be dinosaurs thing. This is our first full group where every bird is warm-blooded. There are some fish that are warm-blooded, but most fish are not. Um, they, birds are adapted for flight for the most part, so they have feathers to prevent water loss, but the feathers are lighter weight and give them lift so that they can fly. They have the hollow bones. Instead of having two organs, like two ovaries, they'll just have one so that they weigh less. And so everything about a bird is adapted for flight, except for flightless birds like ostriches and emus. They still have the feathers, but they don't have the hollow bones anymore and they're not adapted for flight. Then we get to the mammals, class mammalia. Um, they have to have hair, they have to have mammary glands in order to be a mammal, essentially. There's three different groups of these, and we talked about them the first time back when we were talking about evolution. So monotremes are our egg layers. That includes the duck-billed platypus, which most people know what that looks like, so I decided to show you the echidna instead. An echidna is essentially an egg-laying hedgehog, so that's what an echidna is in that little gif. Marsupials. Um, they have a pouch. The babies are born super young and then have to crawl their way into the pouch. Now I'm going to show you a video. Um, there are some bad words in the video, but they do a really good job of explaining marsupials. And so here is Zay Frank talking to you guys about marsupials. Oh, apparently after this ad for Toyota sign. We will explore true facts about marsupials. Marsupials. Uh, is this really the best shot? 
It looks like pornography. Not nature. Oh, that's better. Marsupials. <laughs> I just took it in the noodle. <laughs> Marsupials are metatherians, a group of mammals that split off from our eutherian ancestors over 160 million years ago. They may look like other mammals, but inside, marsupials are hiding something that doesn't exist. What? Marsupials lack the ability to grow a placenta, which is an organ that looks a bit like a bloody pillow. It acts as a waste and nutrient exchange, and protects the baby from its mother's immune system, which allows human babies, for example, to mature inside the warm. Trust me, the cartoon version is much better looking than the real thing. Lacking the protection of a placenta, marsupial babies have to get the hell out quickly. The kangaroo baby emerges after only seven weeks in the- Oh my god. <laughs> it, looks, it looks like a dog penis that's trying to escape. <laughs> Run, little red rocket. Run. It is blind, but remarkably has fully functional forelimbs, and it uses them to climb up the mother's midline until it reaches the pouch. It looks, it looks like Voldemort at the end of the series. <laughs> the pouch is a bit like a pocket, but it has nipples in it. The baby latches onto the nipple, and the nipple inflates inside the baby's mouth, forming a seal. For the next 100 days, the baby cannot let go, as it receives milk from its mother. To understand this, imagine putting on a blindfold and sniffing your way across a shag carpet until you found a nipple that was just as large as you were, and then thinking, I should put it in my mouth. That is how a kangaroo do. I'll tell you right now, we are not going to talk about the Tasmanian Devil, because that is not a polite way to eat. That's starting at the wrong end of the ice cream cone, if you know what I mean. I know it's in Australia, and they do everything reverse down there. You've heard about the toilets. If you haven't, supposedly the Australian puts his head in the toilet bowl and pees upwards. Just the opposite of us. Really? Who does that to a chicken? The wombat is another marsupial. <laughs> Are you trying to hide? <laughs> it's effective. Unlike the kangaroo, it has a rear-facing pouch. This is because the wombat digs and lives in burrows. Here we see two wombats, both good at digging, but one is clearly an idiot. On the plus side, if you're a baby, a rear-facing pouch prevents you from getting a mouthful of dirt. On the downside, it means there is a butthole directly in front of your doorway. They kind of break even, really. The marsupial's penis. Oh, we always do this. Why? I don't want to talk about their penises. It's This should be about the majesty of nature. It's like reviewing an opera and, I don't know, talking about Wagner's penis. No, I don't want research to Google that, Jerry. Oh, fine. Most marsupials have two-pronged penises, and the female has between two and three vaginas. Which sounds like a math problem, but, I mean, we have one-to-one, -one, and it's not like it's not complicated, so... Now you know. The koala is perhaps the cutest of all the marsupials, but it appears to have received the short end of the evolutionary stick. Jerry, don't bleep it like that. It sounds like I said... You don't even have to bleep stick. The koala lives mainly in the eucalyptus tree, and almost exclusively eats the eucalyptus leaf. The eucalyptus leaf, on the other hand, has made it clear that it doesn't want to be eaten by anyone. Aside from having very little nutritional value, it is poisonous and very hard to chew and digest. To deal with this, the koala has evolved a very long hind gut, which ferments the leaves, sometimes for over 100 hours. A remarkable and complex adaptation that the koala could have avoided by eating pretty much any other f***ing thing. Baby koalas don't have the fully developed piping to do this hindgut fermentation. So instead, they eat their mother's fecal pap. What is that, a little popsicle? Oh, it's two words. Fecal pap. Oh, oh, that's gross. Fecal pap is a pre-digested greenish goo. Like you know how a cow regurgitates cud, right? And it's like that, except out of your ass, and you feed it to your child. The diets of most herbivore marsupials pose another challenge. The coarse grasses and leaves wear down their teeth. Each has evolved a unique strategy to deal with this. The kangaroo has four sets of molars, which move forward as the front pairs wear down. Wombats have rootless teeth that never stop growing. 
The koala's unique strategy is to have neither of these, so when its teeth wear down, it just starves to death. Not only that, <laughs> but the koala has the smallest brain-to-body mass ratio of all the mammals, and it has a smooth brain, which means that it hasn't evolved the thinky-thinky parts. For example, if you pick eucalyptus leaves, which it eats, off the branch and put them on a plate, the koala doesn't know what to do with them. Not a genius animal. However, this lack of brain gives the koala a discreet evolutionary advantage, in that it does not give a fuck. Case in point, koala in the rain, no f**ks given. None. Just remember. Alright, that's where we're going to stop that one. It really does explain the marsupial stuff pretty well, so that's where we're going to cut that one off. The last group of mammals is the one we're in. We are placental mammals. We talked a little bit about the placenta when we were in the reproductive chapter. So that means we can give birth to babies that are a little bit more advanced. They have a better chance at survival. And so both the cat and the baby it takes down are placental mammals in that gif. Here are the answers to the questions. As always, just pause the video to get what you need. Critical thinking things. Hmm. All right, now I gotta flip ahead in my book. Hold on. Don't you love how I make you guys hold on instead of just pausing the recording? I'm so nice to you, Emma. All right. Oh, there we go. Bats and birds both fly. Are they in the same class? No. Um, so. Bats are mammals, birds are more reptilian, and so they are in the class Aves instead. Um, like I said in the description here, we don't use locomotion to put an animal into a certain group. Instead, we use other features, and their wings aren't developed the same way as well. So just, you know. Uh, number two, ostriches and penguins don't fly. Should they be in the class Aves? They still have feathers. Um, from a DNA standpoint, they are more related to the birds than they are to any other group. So to me, yes, but I'm sure we could argue about it. And number three, is a crocodile more closely related to a bird or a lizard? To help answer this one, I actually pulled up the phylogenetic tree for these guys. So it asked again about, I already forgot, crocodile and is it more related to bird or lizard? So here's the crocodile. It's on this branch of the tree. Here are the birds off over here and here's the lizard. What you have to do to see who are they most related to is see who has the closest branch point. And so here is the branch point between the crocodilians and then the birds. And yet way back here is the branch point that leads to the lizards and snakes and then leads to the crocodiles and them. And so they're actually more closely related to the birds than they are to the lizards off over there. Um, next up, number four, what evidence do taxonomists use to classify animals? Well, it kind of depends on the taxonomist. Nowadays, we tend to use more DNA evidence than anything else, but back in the old days, we would just use visible features. Number five, what are model organisms and how do we use them? Model organisms are things that we use in the lab to study certain features. Like if you remember uh, Gregor Mendel, when we were talking about genetics, he used garden peas as his model organism. Nowadays, we use um, a roundworm called Cynorhabdus elegans, and I'm sure I said that genus name wrong. We use fruit flies as model organisms. We use mice and rats as model organisms, and that's because we can't just test everything on people to see how things go down. We have to test on the model organisms first, and then based on those tests, if they were safe enough on the model organisms, we can maybe t take it up to people at that point. How do the body coverings of fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals all differ? So first off, the fish, reptiles, and birds do all have scales. However, fish scales are completely different from reptile and bird scales. Reptile and bird scales are both made out of keratin. Um, and again, there are a lot of people who believe that birds should actually be put into the reptile group, but birds do also have feathers and not just the scales. Amphibians have uh, the thin skin that a fish has, but without the scales at all. And mammals then have our nice thick skin with thin hair or fur on top of that. That said, I will just kind of mention this little weirdo. So here we have armadillos. Armadillo is a weirdo because it doesn't have the hair or fur over most of its body, just on the belly. So a lot of people could mistake them for reptiles if they didn't know any better. Same thing can happen with this pangolin, which is a type of anteater. They have scales that look very reptilian, but if you flip them over, they have hair or fur, and so they're actually mammals. They do also feed with mammary glands, so they really are mammals. 
What are some reasons for the recent decline in amphibians? Unfortunately, there's a lot of reasons. So we are in a mass extinction event for amphibians at this point, and I've listed several of the reasons that are up there, but one of them is they're, they're honestly not all that bright. This is an axolotl. Um, they are something that is actually an endangered species, and it should be illegal to own them, and yet some people own them as pets. They are found in only, I think, one lake in Mexico, maybe two, but I think just one. And that lake has lots of problems going on. And so there are people who are raising them in aquariums at home because their lake is really in trouble. And that can kill off the whole axolotl as a group. Um, it is an amphibian. It's a salamander type thing. It didn't complete the metamorphosis, so it kept the tail, it kept the gills. It shouldn't have, but it did. It's a weird little critter, basically, but you can kind of see how cute it is, but also just how dumb and slow its reflexes are at the same time, because he did not even sort of kind of catch that food pellet. Um, so this one does have gills to breathe through, but it does also use its skin, and it does gas exchange across the skin. Well, there's a fungus, it's called a chytrid fungus. It infects the skin of amphibians and it dries the skin out and it makes it so they can't breathe through the skin. And the gills aren't enough. They have to breathe through the skin too. And so they'll die off essentially through suffocation. Um, the water pollution has led to reproductive problems in amphibians. And so they're not breeding as well as they used to be able to. And then the deforestation just hurts water quality in a bunch of different ways. We have altered the flow of water. Um, in fact, the river, I forget what the name of the river is, but there's a river that goes from the Colorado mountains all the way down towards Mexico, like right at the boundary between, it's not the Rio Grande, it's probably going to be the Rio Grande and I'm just going to be an idiot, but anyway, but right at the boundary between California and Mexico, that river hasn't actually run to the ocean in a very long time because we put dams in all the rivers and that means there's lots of area that doesn't have water that was supposed to have water and that sort of thing it really hurts amphibians because they need that water to reproduce to survive to breathe to feed for all of those things and so yeah amphibians are really just in trouble all right so as that says, that's all the new material that we are doing in the lab. So at this point, make sure you take your post lab quiz on the animal kingdom and then get ready for practical number two.